Have you ever found yourself in a situation that felt hopeless? Like there seemed, it seemed like there literally was no answer. Like you felt like you were below the bottom of the bottom. I'm gonna show you in this video today exactly what you have to do to come out of that because there's one component that's absolutely essential. That component, I'm, in fact, I'm even gonna tell you what the component is. The component is confidence. And I'm gonna teach you today how confidence conquers challenges. Now, confidence is a really, really interesting thing. And mo it's fascinating to me that most people lack confidence. Like, what's the difference between, let's say, somebody like Elon Musk. Musk. I, <laughs> yeah, I said it like there was more than one. <laughs> what's the difference between, <laughs> between Elon Musk and some other entrepreneur who's out there on the struggle bus? Elon Musk, he had um, enough confidence or positive, empowered expectations to act on his ideas through the point of no return. What does that mean? So, so when you're flying an airplane, like when you're, when you're like in a Cessna 172, right? And you're taking flying lessons and you get on the tarmac and like you go, like you're like full thrust, right? And, and you're, you're, there comes a point on the runway that's called the point of no return. The, like, we are going to take off, or we gonna, we're going to crash. But we are not slowing this plane down, right? And so, and so m most people approach the point of no return with so much caution and trepidation, they don't build up enough ground speed to turn it into airspeed so they can fly. And I was thinking yesterday, as... As I was thinking about business, I was thinking about all the people who struggle in business, I'm thinking to myself, struggling in business, it makes sense from the standpoint that people do it, but beyond that, it doesn't make sense because there's no need, because there's a whole world full of people with problems that they'd be willing to pay to solve. And the, the reason I think people struggle in business is because we're so focused on figuring out how to get paid when the formula already exists for getting paid, find somebody with a big problem and enough money to pay to solve it and solve it for them. Find a big pool of people with some big problems. And, and I was thinking, like I was, after I got done doing some work yesterday, because we, we had a bunch of work, a bunch of stuff that we had to do in the morning. So after I got done working yesterday, I went to the golf course and I'm at the golf course. And while I was at the golf course, playing golf, my business cash flowed like $165,000 while I'm at the golf course. Money that I wasn't expecting. It just kind of showed up. <laughs> right? Well, that's better than a sharp stick in the eye. And I'm not, I'm not flexing. And I was thinking, why is my life in business this simple? Like, if, if I were going to say, I can only pick one component to use in business, what would it be? If I only had one attribute, what would it be? And it would be confidence from, a, from an empowered expectation. I, and you've heard me say this before, I'm gonna say it again. Expectation is a human being's greatest superpower. But most people only use their expectation against themselves. And there are a handful of people in the world that use their expectation for their own betterment. Like, do you realize, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna break it down. I'm gonna, read the, I'm gonna read the text here in a minute in the Bible, because this is a Bible study, but I'm laying the groundwork. What did Bishop say? He said, I, m my messages are very short. It's the introductions that take all the time, right? So, so, so when I think about people who are struggling and the difference between people who are struggling and people who are not struggling, the number one difference is expectation. Like expectation is a superpower that's better than Spider-Man's ability to spin a web any size and catch thieves just like flies. It's better than Superman's ability to fly. Like, I'm not saying it's better, it's actually better. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Here's my question. What if that's true? And I say that facetiously, obviously, because it is true. 
So you think you have a problem doing the thing. Well, I wish I had some help in here. Hold on. But you actually have a problem believing you can do the thing. See, your, 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 your expectation is either going to be empowered by design or disempowered by default. But guess who gets to decide? You do. You get to decide whether you're going to allow your expectation to be disempowered by default or am I going to just have an intention, set my intention, and decide to design an expectation that I will hold in my attention until it becomes my experience of life. And I know, some of y'all think this sounds like woo-woo. Well, it's only woo-woo from the standpoint that when you do it, your life is going to get good. You're going to be walking around talking about woo-woo, woo-woo, (laughs) woo-woo, (laughs) woo-woo. Sorry. (laughs) Y'all know, y'all pray for me, don't judge me. This is a judgment-free zone. Okay, all right. So, so I'm telling you, I'm telling, I, I'm, 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 I'm sharing with my friends a truth that I have discovered to be the absolute truth. And I started practicing years ago not allowing myself to give any attentive energy at all to outcomes that are undesirable to me. We are, we are so good at focusing on what could go wrong, we make it go wrong. And the way we make it go wrong is by avoiding the actions that could make it go right because we're worried about it not going right. And so therefore, the neglect of the actions that would make it go right cause it to go wrong. Mm, no Lord. Now, I'm going to read a story in the Bible that we all know, but there's stuff in this story that we're unfamiliar with. And it's so powerful. What if you believed, what if you really believed that if you wrote a book It'd sell a million copies in the first 12 months. How long would it take you to get that book done? Oh, man, I had that thing done this afternoon. Right? Right? Am I telling the truth? But so, so you can see clearly, what if you believed that the next 10 prospects that you talked to were going to say yes to your most premium value offer? you get them done today. But see, your belief in it not working is so much stronger than your belief in it, whatever it is, working that you don't work on it. And I know I keep saying the same thing over and over, but, be, but I, like, I, I don't think, I, don't, I really don't think that y'all out there in the YouTube sphere and those of you in this room really wrap your mind around the, the, the enormity of the truth that I'm, with every fiber of my being, attempting to convey to you today. It's like, what if? the only thing that was impossible for you were that something would be impossible for you? What if that were the only impossibility in your life? Because I'm going to tell you something. A hundred years ago, flying on an air, or 130 years ago, flying on an airplane was an impossibility. Now we do it like, well, of course this thing takes off at redonkulous speeds in this tin can in the air with flammable fluids in the wings by the gallons and hundreds of gallons and thousands of gallons. But of course this thing, this thing that weighs a quarter of a million pounds for a 757 or 987,000 pounds for a 747. Of course this thing should fly five miles in the sky at 500 miles an hour or three miles in the sky at 500 miles an hour. Of course it should do that. Of course this makes sense. Quit tripping, you know that don't make any sense. You don't see any buses up there. They weigh less than planes. (laughs) But we act like it's normal. We act like it's normal that we can, I can take this, this, this piece of aluminum and glass, and, and, and so if, if I take this, let me see if it works, if I can get it to do, I'm not, I know it works, but okay, so what, we take this thing, and, and we call it a phone, right, and we say it has buttons on it, but you know those aren't buttons, right, those are just lights, 
those are just lights arrayed like buttons. And I touch those little lights, and then within a matter of a few seconds, I can be having a, con- a real-time conversation with my brother who lives in the Netherlands, and we act like that's normal? The reason we can do this is because somebody believed it was, impo- was it possible when everybody else believed it was impossible. And here's my question. What are you right now believing is impossible that 100 years from now will be normal, but somebody else is going to discover it because you're too busy believing in how it can't work? I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by how people help the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism beat them up. Like, I ain't going to hold me down while you hit me. Oh, no, I'm going to hold mine down. You hit it. No, I ain't holding mine down. Do you understand? Okay. (laughs) Some people have a problem with the fact that I talk about business and success and making money. Congratulations, you are righteous. (laughs) Do your thing. But God made everything he created to succeed. He made the sun to shine, it shines. Nobody has a problem with that. He made the wind to blow, it blows. Nobody has a problem. He made fish to swim, they swim. Nobody has a problem with that. He made human beings to rule. And when we start having dominion, people start getting issues. That's your problem, not mine. I'm just doing what he told me to do. So, I implore you, I beseech you, I beg you, Stop taking your past experiences, projecting them on the screen of your future, recreating the past and thinking that you're living in the present. Stop it. Start asking better questions. If you do, I promise you, you will get better answers. There are people in this room, there are people watching me on YouTube right now. You have more talent than me, more skill than me. You just don't have as much belief as I do. Your expectation is not as strong as mine. My expectation works for me over time and triple time. I don't even have to pay it any extra, but it pays me extra. So, let me read the story. That was the introduction. Because, like, where does this confidence come from? See, some people think that I'm going to muster up some confidence so they have confidence in confidence. Well, that's dumb as a box of rocks. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you where it comes from. I'm going to show you where mine comes from. You can get yours from wherever you want to, but this, this is a pretty good source and it don't run out. Okay, here's what it says. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 17. I read verse 23 to verse 30. Here's what it says. I, I, I'm going to start with verse 22. So, so tell you the story. I'm going to lay the groundwork because otherwise I have to read the whole chapter. Right? So David and Goliath is a story about a young man who's probably about 13, maybe 14, 15. I don't know, but he was a t- teenage boy. Who fought a Goliath, who fought a giant that was 10 feet tall. 10 feet. 10 feet is three feet taller than Shaquille O'Neal. He pat Shaquille on the head. What's up, little dude? How you doing? Right? That's big. This dude was so big. How big? How big was he? was so big, he had to have six toes on each foot and six fingers on each hand. That's a big joker. I got some big hands, but we only got five digits. This joke had six. He was so big that his spearhead weighed 16 pounds. That's a big joker. So you know how heavy, 16 pounds is the heaviest bowling ball they got. Y'all know, you know how your bad your shoulder hurts when you're slinging a 16-pound bowling ball? Imagine slinging a 16-pound, a, a spear that has its own weight plus a 16-pound spearhead. Child, please. Okay, so this guy was the champion of Gath. Now, the word champion, you got to go do the research. The word champion doesn't mean he was just a guy who won a lot of fights. No. A champion was a person who went and fought a battle, and that decided the outcome of the war. So when it says Goliath, the champion of Gath, that's why he said, send me a man that I may fight against him. And if I win, then you will be our slaves. And if you win, then we'll be your slaves. Okay, y'all tracking, right? So verse 22, so David left the carriage, and so David's father, David wasn't in the military, but his three oldest brothers were in the military, and so his dad said, hey, David, 
take your brothers who are in the military, take them some corn and some cheese and some bread. I always jokingly say cheese, grilled cheese sandwiches and corn on the cob, but it wasn't that. It was just some corn and some cheese and some bread. Okay, so, so David takes them. Um, so David takes them the food. And he's on his way to go see his brother. So it says in verse 22, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and he ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, there came up the champion of the Philistines, of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and he spake according to the same words and David heard them. And the words were, like I defy the armies of the living God, blah, blah, blah. Send me a man that I may fight against him. If I win, then you'll be our slaves. Okay, that whole story. And, um, and then it says, and um, as the same words, and David heard them, verse 24, and all the men of Israel saw the man. When they saw the man, they fled from him, and they were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up? And he shall, it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches. Like, sign me up. I'm in. I'll, right? Enrich him with great riches. Okay? Number two, um, give him his daughter to be his wife. Okay? So, and then make his father's house free in Israel. No more taxes for your family. Now, that one's really a sign me up right now. I'll fight him right Bring me a Goliath right now. I'm going to go get my five smooth stones. I'll be back in a minute, right? Okay. Y'all track it. And David spake to the men. So they told him what they would get. And then David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him again after the same manner, saying, um, After the same manner saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when David spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why camest thou down hither? And with whom have thou le- hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. Thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Now, here's the question. Why is his brother so bent out of shape? Is that a good question? Why is it like he's like everybody else is scared? He ain't scared. Why is his brother been out of shape? His brother's been out of shape because when you have confidence, you will be misunderstood. People will accuse you of being arrogant, people will accuse you of having an agenda. But let me allow me to free you from the, the thought of the thought prison of other people's ideas about you. It's just none of your business. Like, I don't even have time to think about what you think about me. I don't, I, there's so many levels on which I don't care. Like, I mean, there are levels to this not caring thing. I don't care. Because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here to please you. I'm here to, serve, I'm here to please God and serve you, but I'm not here to please you. So you ain't pleased, that is not, that's not my department. You're gonna have to take that up with the, you're gonna have to take that up with the assigner. But the other reason they were angry is because when Samuel came to their father's house to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the king, when Samuel saw Eliab, he said, surely the anointed of the Lord is before me. Here's what God said. God doesn't see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And this ain't him. And then after that, he kept saying, the Lord has not chosen this. The Lord has not chosen this. The Lord has not chosen this. He should... Do you understand, Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the king, and that son was going to be David, and David's the only one that didn't get invited. So if you're going to be a person of confidence, you have to divorce yourself from what you think other people think about you. His own dad didn't even invite him. He just was, that can't be him, right? Do you understand there are people in your family that look at you like that? Oh, you? Surely you're not the one. There are people who are your neighbors, your friends, people you went to school with, your teachers. Like, you got to ignore all those people who don't believe in you. Can I get a witness? So, Eliab was mad because he was jealous. Okay. And it's easy to be misunderstood when you have confidence. People will mistake your confidence for arrogance. That's their problem, not yours. I don't have time to manage your emotions around me because I have none around you. Okay, y'all get that one on the way home. Okay, so um, 
Eliab's anger was kindled, Eli, um, who you came down to see the battle. See, if I was David, and he's the youngest, here's how youngest brothers answer questions like that. What battle? Y'all ain't fighting, y'all hiding. <laughs> I don't, he didn't say it, but I just, I just well, well, come down and see what battle. Ain't nobody fighting. You, you see any dust kicking up out of there? Y'all ain't, what, y'all talk, what you talking about? Okay. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned toward another and spake after, to him after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. What does it mean he spake unto them after the former manner? He said again, what shall be done through the man that killed this Philistine? Why? Because David wasn't just doing it just to do it. And he wasn't just doing it for the money, but he wanted the money. He wanted the payoff. He wanted the king's daughter. He wanted the payoff. He wanted the tax freedom. He wanted all of it. And see, I, I believe that God put that in the scripture so we could know there's self-interest is not selfish. That's why we brush our own teeth and not our next door neighbors. So all self-interest is not selfish. It's okay to look out for you. It's okay to like do good things for yourself. It's okay to, you don't have to beat yourself up to be righteous and holy. Okay, y'all tracking. You don't have to take a vow of poverty. David said, I want to, okay. Why? Because the mouth of two or three witnesses let everything be established. This is a binding contract. A binding agreement. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, And then it says, when the words were heard which David spake, and they rehearsed them before Saul, he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. This is so cool. Wait till I show you why, though. See, I'm I'm, I'm giving you this background story. Like, I had a guy say to me one time, this is a guy who's... pretty much a multimillionaire. He's like, Myron, he said, he said, I got a question for you. He said, you have more certainty than any human being I've ever met. Do you teach that? I said, I don't teach it, but I can tell you where it comes from. He said, where does it come from? I said, I got this book. And it's filled with conditional promises. If you do this, then you can expect this. And I've been testing it since I was 17. And it works every time. So David, he said, I'll go out and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go out and fight against this. So people who are not doing the thing know all the reasons why you can't do the thing. Because they think their limitations are your limitations. And you are not even vaguely familiar with their limitations. You certainly don't believe in them. Can I get a witness? Okay. Thou art not able to fight. Thou art not able to go out and fight this Philistine, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. You're a kid. You're a little kid. He's been a man of war since he was a little kid. And David said unto Saul, "He's authenticating. He's about to authenticate. Y'all ready? Y'all want to see some authentication?" Here's what David said. David said. David said unto Saul, "Thy servant, kept, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth." And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. He chased down a bear to save a lamb? I can't speak for y'all. Me? I'd have brought the bear some lamb sauce and some salt and some pepper. I ain't fighting no bear for no lamb. A lion? No, David said, no, that's my dad. No, you can't have that sheep. That's my daddy. Man. David said, I slew him. And then he said, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So I'm going to tell you what happened next. Saul tries to give David Saul's armor. Because people who can't do the thing want to give you the stuff that doesn't work for them, hoping that it'll work for you. Well, David said, I cannot go with these. I have not yet proved them. I, I can't even walk in this stuff. I'm going to fight a giant. He got, he, David said, I got some stuff I'm familiar with. I need to work with the stuff that I know how to work. This is not my tool set. 
And working with these tools is not my skill set. So I'm going to use my mindset, which I'm going to go kill this Philistine. I already told him I'm going to take his head off and I'm going to feed his carcass to the birds of the air today. And I'm up here talking to you. I need to go start killing me a giant. So if you're all right, I'm going to be out of here. Now, here's what David had going for him. The first thing David had going for him, his confidence came, his confidence came because he had a covenant. Notice he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Well, what does that have to do with anything? The circumcision was a sign of the covenant. The word circumcised and the word covenant both mean to cut. God swore to great, 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 and many more greats, grandfather Abraham, that I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. When David heard Goliath cursing the armies of Israel, he knew based on the covenant that Goliath could not win. If Goliath won, God would die today and God ain't fixing to die today. What? Did y'all pick up what we just, what? If like, it would, be, it would behoove you. You would do well to go in scripture and study people who did crazy, amazing things that ordinarily would have made you afraid, but they weren't afraid because they had a covenant. David, uh, Abraham went out and fought against five kings and won with some servants that were born in his house. Why? He was in covenant. David's like, David, David had a covenant, but David didn't just, have a, didn't just have a covenant. David had a call that had not yet been fulfilled. David had already been anointed to be the king. He wasn't the king yet. God don't lie. No, it's not that God doesn't lie. God can't lie. Because the, the Hebrew word truth is the word I met. Oh, I got to show you this. This is so good. So the Hebrew word for truth, the Hebrew word for truth is the word I met. And, and it reminds us of the word that we say sometimes in church, which is what? Amen. Exactly. So Hebrews from right to left. And so it's spelled Aleph, Mem, Tav. Now this is a really fascinatingly beautiful word because Aleph, Mem, Tav, Aleph represents God. That's the letter that, this is God's letter, right? It's, it's the first letter in the Hebrew Aleph bait. It's, it's the strength of the ox. It's the beginning of the word Elohim, El Shaddai, Aleph. It has, it's made of two yodes and above the yodes, this is a yod, this is a yod, this is a vav, a vav is a nail, a yod is a hand. Literally, literally, the letter is made of two hands and a nail. So this is God. Mem is the might of the ocean. What's more mighty than the ocean? What's more mighty than a tsunami? Maybe nothing, right? And so this is God's might or mighty, and then tav is a cross or a covenant. So, the word for truth is God's mighty covenant. That's what the word truth is, God's mighty covenant. What's the might of the covenant? Well, the might of the covenant is a promise on your life. When two people got ready to enter into covenant, they would kill an animal, or when God did the covenant with Abram in Genesis chapter 15, he had Abram bring the animals, and Abram killed the animals, and he cut them in pieces, and God was getting ready to enter into a covenant with Abram. You gotta go read the story, because I'm gonna cover it really, really fast. Uh, he was getting ready to enter a covenant with Abram, but he put Abram to sleep, because Abram, if he had entered the covenant, Abram would have had to die, because Abram couldn't keep covenant. So Abram would have had to die. But also, they start out back to back, when they're, and then they walk around the animal, and they take in the brutality of the death of the animal. They come back face to face. Abram would have been face to face with God. He would have had to die again. Abram was in de- de- double jeopardy entering a covenant with God. So the scripture says, when it came time, when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And behold, when the sun went down, it was dark. A smoking furnace, that's a type of God the Father, and a burning lamp, that's a type of God the Son, passed between those pieces. The substitute for Abram was the burning lamp. And they would enter covenant together. If I don't keep my word to you, may what happened to these animals happen to me. And so, so when God entered a mighty covenant, he's saying, if I don't keep my word, I'm going to have to die. Now, God swore in his own existence to bless those that bless Abram, to curse those that curse Abram. This is God. But if you take these two letters, Mem Tav, it spells the word death. And we all, we've read it before, even if we don't know we have. There's a guy in Genesis chapter six, whose name starts with Mem Tav. Who is it? Methuselah. What does Methuselah mean? His death shall bring. What does his death bring? It brought the flood. Okay? So God, God, and then death. What? Well, when you attempt to remove God from the truth, all you have left is death. That's the first thing we see. We see it in America. We see it happening all the time. We're trying to remove God out of society. We get more and more and more and more death. 
We removed God out of the school system. I don't know that there was ever a shooting in a school ever when the Ten Commandments were hanging on the wall. You remove God from society, all you have left is death. But it also shows us that if God lies, then God dies. And if God dies, everything ceases to exist. This is why David knew Goliath couldn't win. Goliath didn't have any hope. I am going to kill. I'm going to kill you. I hope you can hear me all the way up there. Because I'm going to kill you today. I'm going to take your head off and feed your body to the birds of the air. Did you hear me? (laughs) David had a calling. David had a covenant. David had a covenant. David had a calling on his life. You are going to be the king. David wasn't the king yet, so he couldn't die. He was invincible. He's like, ha, ha, ha. I can go run. I can. The story tells us that when Goliath started coming towards David, everybody else ran from Goliath. David started running at him. Can you imagine the level of confusion Goliath must have? <laughs> David's like running and slinging. And the scripture says he released that stone and it sunk into Goliath's forehead and Goliath fell face down on the ground. You know what it says after that? But there was no sword in the hand of David. Hmm. So he went and stood on Goliath, took Goliath's sword and cut off Goliath's head with Goliath's own sword. See, David had three things going for him. Well, four things. He had a covenant. He had a calling. He said to his brother, is there not a cause? What's the cause? If we lose this battle, we got to be slaves to the Philistines? Oh, that universe don't exist where I'm willing to do that. Let's go. There was a cause. The cause was greater than the consequences. And until in your life, the cause becomes greater than the consequences, you won't face your giants. You'll keep hiding from them. And then lastly, but not leastly, there was compensation. Because he was going to get enriched with great riches, marry the king's daughter, no more taxes. It sounds so heavenly. (laughs) Now, what was his confidence based on? David had confidence because of a promise. See, I have a promise. Here's the promise. I have a whole bunch of promises. If as long as I remember and obey the words of the Lord and honor him with my life, and don't forget him, it is God that gives me the power to get wealth. I don't, as long as I remember, I didn't do this by myself. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. Like, I, like I, did, I know people don't like, but Myron, the Bible says, okay, whatever it says, whatever warnings the Bible gives about money, and it gives us some, they're not contradicting these verses. They, like they all, they all come together to form a beautiful symphony, right? I'm not supposed to lean on money. I'm not supposed to love money. Right? I'm not supposed to lust after somebody else's money. But there's nothing wrong with me having it. I'm not supposed to lay it up for myself, but I am supposed to lay it up for my children and my children's children. Right. See, see, a big problem I have with a lot of people who proclaim to believe the Bible is we pretend that we believe what it says while doing the exact opposite. A good man, okay, I didn't put this in the Bible. So somebody please tell me what this means if it don't mean what it, I'm, how I'm reading it. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, here's what, people, here's what I've had people say to me. Yeah, but, but, but Myron, that's not talking about material things. That's talking about a spiritual heritage. Okay, that sounds good. But here's what the Bible says. Here's how the Bible interprets that. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. So... Let me ask you a question. Would your life be better right now if when you started out and got married and you went out on your own, if your parents gave you a house and some riches, would your life be better? Would you be able to focus more on the purpose of your life rather than just trying to pay bills and exist? Yes. Okay. So in the words of a good friend of mine, Dr. Sonia Stribling, you may not come from a wealthy family, but a wealthy family should come from you. My parents didn't give me a house. They, I'm, I'm sure they would have if they could have, but they couldn't. They didn't know how. But 
What if we are the first generation that our children actually inherit house and riches from us? That'd be pretty cool, huh? House as a wedding gift. Wow, there's a novel concept, but that's biblical. But you know what we do instead? Our children turn 18 and we send them off to a bunch of Philistines, a bunch of pagans to be miseducated so they can unteach them everything we taught them for the first 18 years. And I said that that way because the reality is the Israelites never sent their children to the Philistines to get educated. But we do. Because we value a degree more than we value God's decrees. I said because we value a degree more than we value God's decrees. And the reality is God was not wrong. Okay. He had a promise. But he also had some principles that he understood David had some principles he understood. If I have work to do, I'm going to do my work. Like, I'm, if I'm going to chase down a lion and a bear to save a lamb, I'm certainly not going to let my mom and my daddy go into slavery behind this Philistine in his big mouth. So he had some principles he believed in, but watch this. He also had confidence because he had some practices. He was competent with a slingshot. You're out there... I mean, you, you know what you do when you have boring work to do, right? You're watching sheep. It's not like they're doing anything interesting. They're sheep. <laughs> right? And so, so what are you doing? You're playing with your slingshot, and you're, you're slinging a stone at a bush, at a tree, at a whatever. Right? But he had developed competence through practice with his sling. So he had tools that he knew how to use. And David had preparation. He had confidence because his preparation made him confident. And see, I read in a book somewhere, and I think it was John Mason's book, An Enemy Called Average, I think is where I got this from. But he said, you better spend some time preparing for your future because you're going to spend the rest of your life there. There are very few things in the world as important as preparing for what's coming. What did Abraham Lincoln say? I will prepare myself and perhaps my time will come. What does Myron Golden say? Oh, your time coming whether you prepare yourself or not. If you're prepared when your time comes, it will reveal you. If you don't, it will expose you. Is your life going to be a grand reveal or an expose? Well, I guess that depends on how much you prepare. Let's don't go out of here and shrink away from our responsibilities, our challenges, and our difficulties. Let's have enough confidence to charge them boldly because we know that anything we face, we are number one bigger than it, and number two, we are above it. Let's stop going through life assigning a level of difficulty to something before we ever engage in the activity. Oh, this is going to be so hard to learn a language. It'll be so hard to learn an instrument. It'll be so hard to learn how to start a business. It's so hard. And so we, 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 we've learned how, through the miseducational, misdirectional system, a.k.a. the government indoctrination camps, child prisons, schools, whatever you want to call them, we've learned how to assign levels of difficulty to every task before we even embark on the task. In the words of the late great Ogmandino, the path is smooth. Why do you throw stones before you? Let's go out of here and expect that everything that God has told us about us in his word is truth. And let's walk out these doors today believing that it's going to work because we're going to make it work. Let's leave here with an expectation that's empowered by design and let's abandon forever the expectation that it is inherited by default. If we will do that, we can have confidence and a level of expectation that will make our wildest dreams our new normal. I hope this blesses you. Stay blessed by the best, my people, and I'll see you in the next video.